For Christmas 2014, thanks to the generosity of a special, uh, supporter of Import Gaming for the win, I received something I've wanted for many years now. A PC Engine. The Japanese version of the TurboGrafx-16 that the rest of the world saw debut in the late 1980s. But what I got was not just any old PC Engine. It was the much-coveted Duo R, which plays PC Engine CD-ROM and Super CD-ROM games, as well as those sleek and sexy Hue cards. In addition to the system, I also received a few games, though I ended up buying quite a bit on my end. Now I have a rather impressive PC Engine software library of 38 titles, spanning pretty much every conventional gaming genre. I've spent quite a bit of time with each of these games and have had nothing but great experiences with this amazing system. When Matt Ezero, aka Cygnus Destroyer, the LGN Defender, or the idiot who doesn't know good games, bought his first TurboGrafx-16, he did an awesome multi-part, multi-review series, and I planned on ripping him off. Uh, I mean, taking inspiration from his example, and doing something similar with a three-part PC Engine love fest dubbed the Pretty Cool PC Engine Extravaganza. However, after nearly completing part one of these videos and being sidetracked by other projects, I realized I just don't have the time to follow through with the whole thing. So the PC PCEE is cancelled. Not all is lost, though, since I'll cover all of my PC Engine loot in the style of my import pickups for the win number one video sometime soon, and I'll also let you folks see the seven mini reviews here that would have kicked off the pretty cool PC Engine extravaganza. Rest in peace, my friend. You're better off not being a part of this cruel world. Anyway, here we go. Special Criminal Investigation, or SCI is a 1991 port of an arcade action driving game from Taito. It's the sequel to the coin-op hit Chase HQ, a title which was ported to the PC Engine in 1990 and localized for the TurboGrafx-16 in 1992. SCI puts the player behind the wheel of a sexy Nissan 300ZXZ32, taking on the role of two cops, Raymond Brody and Tony Gibson, who act as driver and gunman respectively. The goal of each stage is to track down a car housing any number of criminals and take it out by whatever means necessary. The controls are really simple and feel just right. You can exhilarate, brake, and move left and right with the car, and pressing another button has Gibson peeking out of the passenger side and shooting his pistol straight ahead. Some levels even let you use a bazooka, which is airdropped by a police helicopter. Bad ass. While the pistol's supply of bullets is infinite, ammo is limited for this weapon, but as you'd expect, it packs quite the punch. There were a lot of good arcade ports for the PC Engine, and SCI is no exception, though it takes a notable step down graphically from its arcade predecessor, and the lack of proper scaling effects can make some of the visuals look strange. Just look how huge some of these cars look. Man, I hate when BBCs get in the way of a good chase. While this version of the game remained Japan only, a Master System version was released abroad. If you're looking for something a little more true to the arcade experience, Taito did put together a compilation disc including both SCI and Chase HQ on the Sega Saturn. But I'd still recommend this version for fans of arcade driving games. A game that seems like it's another arcade port, but is actually an original game made in 1992 for the PC Engine Super CD-ROM format, is Travel Apple, a cute arena combat game starring the titular Apple, a girl from Antarctica dressed up in a pink penguin mascot costume. That age-old stereotype. Published by Nippon Telenet, and developed by its subsidiary game studio Riot, the team behind Super Famicom cult classic Psycho Dream, the main mode of this game is a single-player adventure that sees Apple and friends travel all around the world and find their way into a bunch of unusual situations that always lead to the same conclusion. Explosions and beatdowns, Antarctica style. You can pick up a variety of different objects in each stage that randomly appear, including health items, clubs, and bombs. Weapons can be tossed or used to bludgeon your opponent, and as the game progresses, 
magic attacks and support spells can be learned to give you the edge on the battlefield. Although the enemies can be cheap and there are a lot of hazards in each state to avoid, most of the typical scrubs are pretty easily disposed of, and sometimes the AI leaves a lot to be desired. But boss fights are usually challenging and bring some much needed variety to the standard gameplay. Travel Apple is supplemented with some nice cutscenes complete with decent voice acting, and there's even a two-player deathmatch mode, which is a little lacking in options, but a lot of fun. Overall, Travel Apple is a pretty entertaining arena combat game that's no classic, but could fit in nicely somewhere between sessions of Bomberman. If you like cutesy games, but not the arena combat genre, then Messiah's 1991 hue card based Dragon Egg might be more your thing. This colorful platformer stars Edon, a young girl who discovers from her grandfather that she has the lost ability to harness the power of dragons. A long time ago, dragons and humans coexisted peacefully, but that all came to an end with the coming of Chaos, who, like his namesake, brought Chaos to the land and was thought to have slayed all of the dragon race. Entrusted with the last of the dragon eggs and her grandfather's trusty pair of goggles, Edon resolves to protect and hatch the egg, and with the aid of her dragon companion, sets out to defeat Chaos and restore peace to her world. At first, Edon can only run around and defend herself using her precious dragon egg to attack, which seems pretty counterintuitive, but it gets the job done without any tragedy. Defeated enemies will drop one of two things. Coins which can be used at shops scattered about levels where various power-ups can be purchased, and fire dragon orbs that increase the level of Edon's dragon when enough are collected, as indicated by a meter at the top of the screen. The first transformation will see the egg hatch a dragon well, which has a flame attack with longer range. At the next level, it becomes a medium-sized mountable dragon which can shoot out fireballs that travel across the screen. And for its final form, you have yourself a full-fledged dragon that spits out multiple fireballs, has an impressive jump that lets you skip pesky platforming sections, and whose massive wings slow down its ascent. Dying at any point in the game will reset all dragon power-ups to zero, and it's hard to bounce back and build the dragon up to its peak form again, kind of like what happens in a lot of old-school shmups. Because of this, I ended up playing a majority of my first playthrough using the egg and dragon whelp forms, which was pretty challenging at later levels. There are six stages total, and each one ends with a boss fight, which all play out pretty differently from one another, despite taking place in the same arena. Regrettably, it's in this area where Dragon Egg's biggest flaw becomes apparent, and it might just be a deal breaker for most. After learning all the patterns of the bosses and pitfalls of the stages during my first playthrough, I was able to beat the game on my second try with a fully powered Dragon Companion without losing a single life, all within 15 minutes. Yes, just 15 minutes. I mean, look how a fully powered up character just destroys this boss. Dragon Egg is incredibly short, which is truly a shame, because other than its unfortunate length, everything else here has the makings of a must-have action platforming game. There are three difficulty levels, but no other options or side missions in game to make the experience last longer, so be aware of that if you decide to pick this one up for yourself. For fans of darker, more mature action platformers, there's Namco's 1986 classic arcade hit, Genpei Tomaren, ported to the PC Engine in 1990. The game is set during the Genpei War, which took place during Heian period Japan, and players assume the role of a real-life historical samurai named Taira no Kagekiyo, but in his undead form. That's right, you play as a samurai zombie. You see, Taira no Kagekiyo died during the war and failed in his mission to assassinate his samurai clan's enemy, the shogun Minamoto no Yoritomo. 
But in Genpei Tomaden, historical fiction ensues and the fallen warrior is resurrected, determined to get the job done this time around. There are three different playstyles in the game. Small mode, which involves standard side-scrolling with normal-sized sprites. Plain mode, which is played in an overhead perspective. And big mode, where sprites are supersized and sword combat is the main focus. Genpei Tomaden is a challenging enough game by its intended design, but its less than stellar hit detection and programming can make it frustratingly difficult in many sections. I still find the game really enjoyable, and continues are infinite, so with enough perseverance, skill, and sometimes luck, you can tackle this one without breaking any controllers. I planned on talking about this series in detail during my Getsu Humaden episode, which was about halfway done before it was lost forever in a hard drive crash. I might still do that episode, but just to mention a bit about the connection between the two games, let's just say Konami's Famicom Classic took a little too much inspiration from Genpei Tomade, and there was a bit of controversy behind that. Anyway, while the arcade cabinet and PC Engine version of Genpei Tomaden were never released internationally, an arcade port of it was localized for Namco Museum Volume 4 on the PlayStation, and its sequel was published for the TurboGrafx-16, dubbed Samurai Ghost. Another darker action platforming game I got was Capcom's legendary Daima Kaimura, known as Ghouls and Ghosts outside of Japan. Published by NEC Avenue for the ill-fated Super Graphics entry in the PC Engine console family, this is a near-arcade perfect port, and is widely considered the best of the only five games made exclusively for the system. I was really excited to play this, except there was one major problem. It doesn't play on any console but the Super Graphics. Not even on the PC Engine systems that came after it, like my Dual R. Oh well, but on the bright side, I now own an obscure piece of Japanese gaming history. Um, the box art is really nice. And the game looks really good on my shelf. Yeah, well, I screwed up big time on that. But one of Capcom's legendary action platformers I actually was able to play on my PC Engine is Strider Hiryu. This is another of the company's arcade games handled by NEC Avenue, and was originally slated to be released as a Super Graphics Hue card. Numerous delays resulted in a 1994 release date, and the game finally debuted as a PC Engine arcade CD-ROM, which can only be played in conjunction with an arcade card peripheral that contains the necessary RAM needed to run the disc. If you don't have the card in place and try to boot up the game, it opens up with this. <laughs> nice little touch. Anyway, this is a pretty good port of the arcade original, though it plays a bit slower and the overall feeling is quite different. To illustrate what I'm talking about, some enemies now require you to duck in order to defeat, bringing the action to a halt which is in stark contrast to the arcade original, where simply running and attacking took care of most foes. This slows the pace of the game down significantly, and adds an artificial level of challenge that makes playing some sections more tedious than fun. The graphics are pretty good, but not quite as nice as its arcade counterpart. Here's a comparison between the PC Engine version and the PlayStation 1 port of the arcade game that came with Strider 2. Just keep in mind that I used composite to record from the PC Engine, while the PS1 footage was taken using component outputs, so the latter appears much more crisp and clear by default. Not all is bad in this conversion, however, as there are a lot of cutscenes and story bits added in between stages, as well as dialogue before boss battles. For example, in the arcades, the fight with some acrobatic Chinese martial artists simply begins with little fanfare or warning. But in the PC Engine port, some words are exchanged before the battle starts. Strider Hiryu was pretty revolutionary at the time of its release in arcades for a number of factors, one of which was for having spoken dialogue that reflected the nationality of the character speaking. 
However, this adaptation foregoes that, and everyone just speaks in boring old Japanese. Another welcome addition here is the inclusion of a brand new stage which takes place after the first level of the game. It's a desert area that has Strider running through enemy encampments, fighting some fearsome beasts, and taking on a tank for the finale. These new features seem to make the PC Engine port of Strider Hiryu the definitive version of the classic, but I have to say that's not the case. It's pretty expensive, more so than the PlayStation 1 Strider Collection, as well as the excellent Mega Drive and Genesis Edition. The requirement of the arcade card makes playing this version an even steeper investment if you don't already have it, so I can only recommend this one for die-hard Strider fans. Rounding out the Capcom titles I purchased for the PC Engine is Street Fighter 2 Dash, Champion Edition. Yep, Street Fighter 2 Dash. People seem to forget about that little apostrophe there. Not that I blame them. Anyway, this is an excellent port of the second of 30,000 updates to Street Fighter 2 The World Warrior, contained in one large 20 megabit hue card. There's not much I have to say about this one. I mean, it's Street Fighter. Here you'll find the arcade mode with the 8 original fighters and 4 bosses and selectable characters, as well as a 2 player versus mode, but there's not much else as far as options or extras. The beginning intro has been cut out completely, and the game just boots up to the title screen. Unfortunately, because of the limited amount of buttons on a PC Engine pad, control is less than ideal. Weak, medium, and strong attacks are mapped to 3 buttons, and select cycles between punches and kicks much like Special Champion Edition on the Mega Drive and Genesis. A six-button pad was released for the PC Engine when this game came out to make it more playable, but to be honest, the standard controller setup isn't so bad once you get used to it. While this version of Street Fighter 2 was never released on the TurboGrafx-16, it was made available for download on the Wii Virtual Console for 700 Wii points. Well, that wraps up what would have been part one of the pretty cool PC Engine extravaganza. I'll get the pickup video out soon, but in the meantime, if you haven't done so already, check out Cygnus Destroyer's two-part totally tubular TurboGrafx-16 special. He covers a lot of good games there in that signature style of his, and not a single bad game is defended in the whole thing. My other YouTuber friend Jay Dubious does a guest review on it as well, which makes it even better. Well, this is Jimmy Hoppe from Import Gaming for the Win, and as always, thanks for watching the show. Until next time, take care.